I find myself using my hands more than anything mm. because it can be the lightest of light touch. It can be really, really firm touch. It could be something to close somebody's eyes or put a hand around a throat or mm. over a mouth or, you know, spreading body parts apart or yeah. wh whatever it is. So honestly, I think my hands are my most favorite tool for sure. So hands number one. Hands are number one. So Mistress Natalie, thank you for joining me on the podcast. You are very welcome. Pleasure to be here. Of course, of course. So I wanted to start with a quote, actually, with someone who I understand may have been a bit of an influence, Robert Maplethorpe. Yes. <laughs> so Robert Maplethorpe was a photographer mm -hmm. famous for portraits, and he documented uh, New York City's BDSM scene in the 60s and 70s, from what I understand. That and, and did uh, a lot of other things, flowers and some self-portraits, mm. but he definitely had his photographs reflect some of his personal exploration into yeah. BDSM and kink. And those are the ones I really gravitated towards. So he says, talking about his own photography, and uh, I believe this was actually his self-portrait, he said, I'm looking for the unexpected. I'm looking for things that I've never seen before. And so I wanted to ask you, for someone who's never seen or experienced BDSM before, what is BDSM? What is it not? Like, could you kind of tee it up for the conversation? Yeah, it's really interesting because I think society has given us a certain view of what BDSM or what a dominatrix is. And that's a really, really narrow scope mm. of what it can encompass. So not that those images don't exist, because they definitely do. But BDSM and kink is a huge spectrum that goes so much above and beyond what we think of that stereotypical woman in the mm. leather outfit with the whip, you know, beating up some some guy. Yes. So BDSM can be anything where there is an exchange, like a power exchange, a role reversal. Um, there's usually somebody who is a top or a bottom or a dominant or a submissive mm -hmm. or a you know slave or a master or mistress. Yes. So this playing with power. Um, it also really encompasses people who have different fetishes. So it doesn't at all have to be this power exchange. It's simply exploring the items that people can fetishize, which mm. could be shoes or latex or leather or particular kind of look. Um, a lot of BDSM and kink also involve role play. Mm. So various scenarios. Um, there's a huge mental aspect to BDSM and, and kink. Um, and that mental aspect is, can be in conjunction with a lot of the physical play that people assume goes on mm -hmm. with BDSM, but there are plenty of BDSM scenes where there isn't any of this impact or bondage or the things you would typically see. The first time I ever saw anything that was in that BDSM world. Did, did you see the movie Euro Trip at all? I didn't. <laughs> so it's about these the group of teenagers that's going on this kind of finding yourself. I think it's post high school, right before college, getting out into the world, losing their virginity. A uh, group of three guys and one girl. And there's a scene in the movie where one of the guys gets lured into a dominatrix dungeon. <laughs> and this is in Amsterdam, I believe. And it's Club uh, Van Der Sex. <laughs> and he goes in and there's a, the front desk is like a spa. Like it, it looks like he's about to go get a massage. It's nice and peaceful. The ladies uh, and the men are wearing like very spa, silky gown style things. And then immediately once he pays for it and he's like, OK, I, I'm I'm in for this. I'm in for the session. Then the lady just goes like this and like the lights come down, like everything turns red. A board comes out like they tie him to the board and they you know, they they whip him. There's nipple torture and he has a safe word that the head dominatrix gives him and 
he's like, all right, at least I have the safe word. And then he pulls it out of his pocket and it's like some 14 syllable German word that he has no idea how to, how to pronounce. So I was like 13 sick. years old watching this. And that was my first initiation into seeing anything like BDSM related, which I know from doing research for the podcast and just looking into some of the cultural things around it, that that is not all of it. It's definitely part of it, but there's a lot of psychological mental things that don't involve like 14 character 14 syllable safe words and getting your nipples ripped off in uh exactly. in the basement of a german club exactly and it, it can involve that yeah. for sure that that is not <laughs> something that is excluded but um it's just a lot broader and can be a lot more to people than one would think mm. so how did you how did you become interested in this industry how did how did you become drawn to being a dominatrix it fell into my lap, <laughs> honestly. Um, so looking back and reflecting, I think I always um, had an interest in it, but I didn't know what it was. Um, thus the sort of Maple Thorpe photos that I saw when I was about 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other imagery that I saw in that uh, age, you know, heavy metal Motley Crue type videos with like the leather and guys with like makeup and, you know, the, the chains and all of that yeah. sort of stuff. So I really gravitated towards the aesthetic of it, not understanding that it was a, a thing. Yeah. Or, uh, a lifestyle, a profession. Um, yeah, like you, you knew it was a passion of people's, but you you didn't know that you could monetize it. Like you could do this for a living. Oh, it was, you know, even much less than that. Like I didn't even understand it was sort of an orientation or I just knew it was attractive. The visuals yeah. were attractive. So I, I had my own sort of fetish for the aesthetic, like seeing the Avengers and Diana Rigg in yeah. the full leather cat suit. I was like, that's hot. Like, yeah. I didn't know it was like kinky. I just knew it was hot. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but when I was, it was my first year of college and I was uh, coming home from like, you know, the, I went to New Paltz and I did not like the country, but so I, I came back, I saw my friend on the train. I was going to the city. She was going to the city. She was like, Oh, why don't you come to work with yeah. me? Let's catch up. I hadn't seen her since she dropped out uh, in the 11th grade. So it had been about a year and a half. Okay. And, you know, I was 18 and you don't ask like, where do you work or whatever? You're 18 and want to go hang out in the city. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. It's just like you're with a friend that's making money and you're just like, all right, I want, I want to go experience what you're doing. I, it was, I just wanted to catch up. Yeah. I was just like, oh, cool. I can hang out. Let's hang yeah. out. And she brought me to work and I didn't know what work was. And I was there for like an hour and we were just bullshitting, talking, just, you know, catching up and seeing how life was, you know, telling her about college and stuff. And then all of a sudden there's like this woman comes down and these other ladies come down and it was in this brownstone in the West Village. And I look at my friends and I was like, what do you do? You know, like yeah. it didn't even occur to me to ask her at that yeah. age. And she's like, oh, this is a role play house. And I was like, what? Like I mm. didn't even know what the hell yeah. it was. Because you have to realize this was 1993. Wow. <laughs> so you, 1993, no, in, not even close to internet. So no you've been cell doing phones. this for th almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years next year. Wow. <laughs> It'll be 30. You, you are just a super Freaking professional <laughs> dominator. Like I'm, you've seen everything, I'm sure. I have seen everything. That's wild. So back then there was really no way to know about this at that young age. I mean, yeah. once I started getting into it, I saw there were like little magazines that you can buy and, and things of that nature. And there were publications, which is how people would advertise or find it. But, you know, first year of college coming from Queens, female, like it was so above and beyond anything mm. I could have been exposed to other than literally just walking mm. through the door. Hey guys, this is a quick reminder that the two best ways you can support the show are by one, leaving a rating and comment on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This is like foreplay for the algorithm because it revs it up and makes our show appear higher in searches. And number two, you can subscribe to Auxoro Premium at auxoro.supercast.com, where for five bucks a month you get bonus episodes and more exclusive content. Thank you for however you choose to support the show. So this first place was a, a brownstone in the West Village. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that when you're walking around, like how many of these brownstones could be <laughs> some sort of sex dominatrix dungeon style place or just something that you would never expect? Like well, what's yeah. going on behind these walls? It's it, uh, Living in Manhattan, as, you know, on and off since I was 18, um, 
always thinking like what's behind the door because whether mm. it's a BDSM club or a dominatrix dungeon or speakeasy or like the most elaborate dining experience behind what looks like this really like, you know, low rent sort of exterior. That's yeah. the beauty of New York. Like you never know what's behind yeah. the door. No, that's, that's cool that you – had an in-person experience drawing you to the thing that you do today because i feel like in the age of the internet everyone sees the thing that they're gonna do like the thing that inspires you and sparks that in the moment like i, I first heard a podcast online i was listening to it on spotify or, or whatever app was out at the time uh you know a lot of things that are creative or uh, just just things that are, are physical experience. I feel like a lot of people now experience that for the first time through something digital. Mm -hmm. So it's cool that you had that experience in person. Like you were you were seeing the the full aspect of it, Trial like by smelling fire. it, yes, yeah, smelling it, <laughs> like literally, like You're all the sensations. <laughs> yes, exactly. No idea what was behind the door. Yeah. Like, no imagery. Nothing. I could look up. No Google to search what this was or what people did in that room. Like literally, other than having someone try and explain it to me that was working there yeah. of what I can maybe sort of expect, it yeah. was literally just, you have no idea what it, what was behind the door and what you were getting into, which was the exciting part of it. It was like, yeah. oh my God, this is so, it's scary and great at the same time. So taking us back to that moment, where you walk through the door, what were you seeing? What was on the walls? What were people dressed like? What did it smell like, look like, like everything? Yeah, so ba back then, the, the place that I worked was definitely really seedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the industry has changed like remarkably in 30 years. Yeah. And the practitioners... I'm, I'm just gonna swing this a little closer. To sure. And the practitioners um, today are, you know, very, very different than years ago. Yeah. The the women that are attracted to this and the players. But back then, it was a, a very, very seedy um, scene. The, the women that I worked with, most of them, to be honest, were like drug addicts mm. or alcoholics. Um, my, my friends included. Yeah. Um, the woman who owned the place did not have like one nice bone in her body and she was all about the money mm. um so from that aspect it wasn't necessarily a really positive experience but i also had this kind of like sid and nancy punk rock oh this is so cool because yeah. this is so like fucked up and bad you yeah. know that i was like okay i want to i want to be here yeah um and it was scary but great and um the it wasn't a like hardcore dungeon there were a few in the city at the time so the woman who ran this place did really do more role play than mm. bdsm but bdsm was part of it so a lot of the scenes had some sort of scenario whether it was a schoolgirl scenario or a teacher student mm. um, do you remember what scene was going on when you were there were so they in transition or the first few times i was there probably the first 10 or 15 times I didn't see any of the scenes because I was just hanging out with my friends mm. so I was like I just want to be here yeah. so I was like hey can I come back but there yeah. was no way you were part of the scene and you didn't even realize it but there was no, no way I would go up into the room or yeah. want to work there yeah. you know for various reasons I mean I was really shy um, I had been morbidly obese like 100 pounds overweight and, oh, wow. And, until I was like 17. So I didn't have boyfriends. So like 100 pounds heavier than you are now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that was like through my whole childhood. Yeah. I was super, super over, overweight. Yeah. And in the 80s, that was really like luckily not a problem. So mm -hmm. I was it was a rare thing to see, which made childhood very challenging, obviously. Um, so the idea of being this like sexy, dominant woman, I was like – not yeah. me. You know? yeah. I was like, I don't know. But I still loved like being there. Yeah. Um, so one day I was there just hanging out and I'd watch the girls get ready for a scene. So I'd get little clues. I'd hear the woman who 
um, ran the place, like talk about this, like if the client gave some notes or something, sometimes you would just go up into the room and he would tell you directly, but sometimes there'd be a full script mm. and like I'd hear parts of the the script and uh, I'd see the girls put on different outfits for the so, particular scene. So the, the dom and the subs have scripts, like they both have parts or is it mostly the dom is, is leading it? How does that work? It could be either way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be d- depend on the person. And like I said, this was a, a place where she pushed more role play. Yeah. So it, gr- it definitely attracted people who were interested in having some sort of fantasy role play aspect yeah. to the scenario. Yeah. Um, and then one day my, my, friends there's a person who came in who had requested two young girls for like a school girl scene where he was being bullied mm. and again my the woman who ran the place you know she would sell anything for anybody and other than my friend the next in age was somebody who was probably about my age now she was maybe 45 or 47 doesn't quite fit into the young school girl yeah. aesthetic <laughs> yeah you really got to get into character for that one um and so he was gonna leave and my friend's like please 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 do the session with me i'm gonna lose the client he's gonna walk out please you yeah. know and i just look at her and in my head i'm like you got the wrong girl i gotta yeah know. you just gotta go full improv at that point but she would you know it's your friends and what so i just walk up the stairs like you know the, the woman who ran the place like gave me some schoolgirl skirt and she's like go and mm. of course she she wanted the money so yeah um i walk up and like my friend's outside the door she's like what you know what should i call you you know because i realized you're not supposed to use your real name yeah I don't fucking no, <laughs> you know, and I'm like so in shock. Um, you're just like in, in the movies when you're just looking at objects around the room, like what is my name when you're trying to fake it? You're just like uh, I, mistress I, I, light poster. Or exa- something like that. Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, luckily I didn't have to be mistress then. It was just like schoolgirl. So yeah. it was a, a little easier, but she's like, what do you want me to call you? And schoolgirl number three. Or right. Something. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I forget what she had settled on. And, um, you know, I don't really remember much about that whole scene. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly don't. I think I was really, truly just completely overwhelmed with yeah. like a- anxiety. But I do have a very distinct memory. And again, this is going back, you know, 29 years, walking out of the room. And as we go to walk down the stairs, she's like, how'd you know how to do that? She's like, those things that you were saying, she's like, I've been doing this, this is for your friend a year. that was working there at the time. Yeah, so we did yes. the double session together. Yeah. And I just look at her and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So obviously I said things in that scenario that um, were poignant and appropriate and things that she was impressed by just like naturally yeah. sort of rolled out of uh, my tongue. So um, you have the natural talent for it. I guess, I guess I obviously did, yeah. and and that, and the rest is history. Like once I once I got my first taste, uh, and of course the woman who who owned the place just saw dollar signs because it was like eighteen year old, fresh face, kind of chubby, like you know, really yeah. cute looking face, and just opposite of all the other women. You yeah. know, um, she was just like work for me. <laughs> so. I, I have to ask you because that, that's incredible that you lost a hundred pounds. It, it's mm-hmm. such a small percentage of the planet's population that is ever going to make a physical change like that. Yeah. So, uh, number one, that's awesome. Thank you. Number two, h- how were clients reacting to you? Oh, as an overweight dom at the time, because you were you were still overweight when you started those first few years, right? So the first few years, yeah, I was. Um, but luckily for me, I was I was probably I don't know maybe about like one one seventy or something. Yeah. So probably about twenty or twenty five pounds heavier than I am now. Mm. Um, but I carried all my weight sort of in the lower part of my body. I never had like a, a fatter face or upper body, so it it wasn't like I was like a super overweight person yeah. um, when I started. Uh, I didn't have the the confidence, obviously, that I probably should have at that point. But, um, you know, the clients loved it because, again, I was young and probably the extra weight made me look even like just like have a softer, softer appearance, yeah. which was quite contrary to, yeah. I think, a lot of the 
people who participated in in the this at, at that point. So I don't think it negatively impacted me. Um, and what I started to realize, because for the first, you know, I don't know, 20 years of doing this, my weight fluctuated a ton. Yeah. You know, like it was just up down. I was trying trying to figure out like how to make this work um, for me and, and not be overweight and not be underweight. So I think my clients saw everything. And the takeaway from that for me was, you know, I've had some of the same clients for 20, 25 years. Wow. Um, so it didn't matter what weight I was. Yeah. Once the connection was formed and the trust built and the experiences start to develop, I just realized it really didn't matter. Yeah, because that, that takes an insane amount of confidence, I imagine, to to lead sessions like that as a teenager, young adult, and then also dealing with the confidence of being overweight. And, and I, w- I was never... Uh, I was never a hundred pounds overweight, but I was probably good like thirty or forty pounds overweight when mm-hmm. I was a teenager, fifteen or sixteen. Yeah. Um, so I don't know the challenges involved with losing that much weight, but I do remember just like very anti confidence moments as a kid where I'm just like looking down in the shower, wondering like why my nipples poke out so much further than my friends. I'm just like, what like how do I make this? It, it like it was affecting a lot of things that I did, and probably still has still after does. effects yeah. to this day. Um, but I, I could not imagine having that lack of confidence that I did, and then also, you know, putting on a bodysuit, like going to see clients, and then just taking complete charge of the room. That that seems something seems like something that that takes uh, like you you had a level of confidence and awareness that most people typically wouldn't have at that age. It was really interesting. Um, you know, when I was younger, I definitely uh, thought I wanted to go into acting. And so in my freshman year at college, I actually thought I took theater classes and figured that's what I was going to do. So for me, it was sort of an exercise in like acting like this dominant, strong, powerful woman that I wanted to be, yeah. but really didn't feel like at all. And mm. because of my interest in acting, I think I was able to really bring that out as sort of a character for many of the years in the mm. beginning that I was doing it. Um, and I, I do really think that being thrown into this industry at that point in my life did help with my confidence because here I am, you know, again, like no real boyfriends up until that point in my life, made fun of horribly. Um, You know, I had lost a a bunch of weight at a certain point actually in high school, but then gained a bunch back. Mm. So I had lost it and then gained it back by the time I was doing this, this work. Uh, and like realizing everyone wanted to be my friend once I was skinny, you know, but I was the same person for 18, 17 years and it was very challenging. Yeah. Uh, but in this BDSM world and at doing it as a profession when I was young, these men who were substantially older than me, you know, most of them were in their forties, um, were picking me cause you went in and you introduced yourself and that's how we did it, you mm-hmm. know, and they had to choose me and pay. Yeah. So in a weird way that the fact that I was being chosen and that there was like a monetary value of like, they're not just being nice to me, yeah. <laughs> it really yeah. helped my confidence. So I think a lot of people, especially at that time, like I said earlier, got into BDSM and kink because I'll be really honest, they, you know, mental health issues, they really hated men, they were too old or fat to be hookers anymore. Like, yeah. that was the kind of dynamic I was dealing with, a lot yeah. of junkies. Um, and for me, it was like this really positive thing, like, oh my God, I'm being chosen and picked by these people, yeah. and there's all these other people in the room, and I'm maybe not this fat, ugly, unwanted one, <laughs> you know? So it was it was this weird, subtle breaking down of my own uh, low self-esteem. Mm. Um, so for me, like getting into kink was like very positive for like self-affirmation of like, wow, maybe this woman that I'm presenting that I want to be, um, I can be. And yeah. it gave me this goal of like, 
putting out there what I want it to be, sort of that fake it till you make it thing, yeah. which is what I was kind of doing. And in that hour, in that two hours, I was her. You know, I was that woman. Yeah. And it felt great. I mean, it took many years for me to be that woman outside the room. <laughs> so you, it sounds like you kind of, you were on the health holistic wave before it became more uh more popular in the dom space like you had that positivity because yeah it seems like there are a lot of industries in the 80s or 90s um i i just watched a documentary on the comedy store out in la mm -hmm. one of the one of the biggest comedy clubs in the world most prestigious and it walks through the culture from the the 70s 80s 90s all the way up till today and it goes through this huge shift where, you know, everyone's staying till 5 a.m. at the comedy mm -hmm. store, doing cocaine, mm -hmm. like fucking in the broom closet, yeah. like all stuff that yeah. if if you want to participate in sounds like a good time. And I fully support people doing that. And I'm, and I'm sure, you know, it still goes on in, in spurts today. But it seems like in, in creative fields and I would consider do you consider like dominatrix mm -hmm. as a creative field definitely it seems like it takes a lot of creativity um and things like comedy there was this shift where for whatever reason people just started becoming more aware mm -hmm. of their how they felt the next day mental health like what they're putting into their bodies and you kind of recognized the toxicity of that early on like you were in the space and you were just like the other the drugs and stuff like this is there but it, it wasn't super appealing to you so it's interesting uh i definitely got on the health and fitness i would say maybe about 10 years before yeah. uh i really started to see a large portion of people going that way because mm -hmm. it's wonderful now like i will look and on twitter and instagram and just around in this industry and it's like you know mindful domination and sadistic coach and like really taking a conscientious look at bdsm why you're doing it the um reasons behind it and making sure that the participants are really doing it for like positive mm -hmm. good healthy reasons um, but it took a while for the industry to to shift in that direction. And I will say for the first 10 years-ish, maybe a little less, eight years, um, while psychologically I think BDSM and kink was really good for me, I still fell into the drugs and all of that stuff. And it took yeah. me a while, um, probably I think 2000. 2000 yeah. is when, so from, from 1993 to 2000, um, I really was using drugs and the scene to self-medicate and like deal with trauma and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So it played into it in, in my career as well. And it made it very easy because it was so accessible yeah. to me. Um, but I still didn't look at my work as that. Mm -hmm. I always took my work really, really seriously. And the things that I did in scene were very positive. The yeah. element outside I totally got wrapped up in for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if if we were gonna walk through some of the most common fetishes uh fetishes play things that clients request and things that you help facilitate in the the dominatrix playground is that mm -hmm. how you would refer to it sure. the, the space That's the studio way. the studio the playground <laughs> studio, yeah <laughs> i i'm sure there's so many different variables and every session is different from the next but it, are there some through lines or some most common things that you find yourself revisiting with certain clients i guess like if if there's something that sticks out that you could give an example of, of services you know whether mm -hmm. it's physical psychological torture just something like that yeah it's really interesting because i've been doing this for a long time i not necessarily with my clients but just in general have seen sort of trends over mm -hmm. the decades which is really uh fascinating to look at sometimes like mm -hmm. i think about the the earlier years of doing this and the kinds of scenes that i had and the things that were requested I remember there was a lot, a lot of corporal punishment, 
a lot, a lot, a lot of foot fetish. That was mm. like huge. So corporal punishment is like spanking, mm-hmm. whipping, stuff like that. Exactly. Um, and and foot fetish was was a huge thing. And also, um, I would say a lot of rope bondage and shibari. What's uh, what's shibari? Shibari is very artful rope bondage. Like I'm sure you've seen, or maybe you haven't, but uh, people in these bondage predicaments, but it looks like art. Like the rope itself almost can look like this beautiful art piece or clothing. So the the rope is the art, mm-hmm. and then and the position. Are people are tied down in certain positions. positions so like you're, yeah. you're imitating a painting or something like that, almost. Or well, no, it's just very. <laughs> The, the rope work itself is the art, the okay. way that it is applied with the knots and the symmetry and the directions that it's going. Um, it's it's really just beautiful. Yeah. It's, and that was very popular. And it it's a skill. It is a, a very, very intense skill, and it takes a lot of practice. It sounds like that's that's something that I wouldn't even think about if someone was like, I want to be tied down. The last thing that would go through my head is, what type of knot do you prefer? Yeah. I'd just be like, all right, I'm just going to fucking make sure this shit is tight but comfortable and then uh, go from there. Mm-hmm. So having that creative aspect is is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it definitely is is an art form. Um, so that was like, I would say in the beginning, then um, strap on play, which is now called pegging, mm. uh, became really popular. And all yeah. of a sudden it was something that a lot of people did not do or wasn't part of the scene. Uh, and it started to become, you know, pretty much consistent for for yeah. people in the industry. Um, and then I would say now it's it's really broad because there's so much accessible so it's hard to pin down any particular things that really stand mm-hmm. out because when i look at my sessions there are, people come to me for my specialties at this point after a long time yeah. and i fell into liking medical play when mm-hmm. i was starting in in my career not the first place i worked at but the second yeah she actually had like a medical table and did a lot of doctor nurse and and all of that sort of stuff and when i was very young i wanted to be a doctor so this fit right in i was like i love medical oh, stuff yeah. i still love medical stuff or anything health related and um so i really started getting into medical play and developed a specialty in it that not a lot of people do yeah so there is a large section of the people that I see that have some sort of medical interest because it's not something that a lot of people do and I am skilled at doing it. So that's. Yeah. Look, I mean, they're, they're, from what I understand, there are a lot of doctors that go through medical school and then a small percentage don't get accepted. So it's like, I just went through eight years of school. What do I do with my life now? And then like (laughs) medical play, you know, you can either become a medical consultant or get into medical play or it's like 400,000 down the drain. So You know, you got to use it somehow. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so, so medical play. Medical play for me so you, is one. So you turn the studio into something that looks like a legit hospital. What, like, uh, like you so, have the stretcher. The do you have IVs? Like people plugged into things like that. So my studio is small. This mm-hmm. it's Manhattan. Yeah. If I if I had room for a stretcher, I would totally have a stretcher. Oh yeah. But I definitely it, now don't. you get like a, if, if you have a stretcher in an apartment in Manhattan, it's like a futon stretcher that <laughs> exactly. folds down from your wall. Everything, you should, everything is in my ceiling yeah. because I, I have to build up. But I have in my studio a section that is for medical play. And Mm. what that has is uh, a bunch of like traditional BDSM gear, but in white or Mm. look or more medical looking restraints. I have a hydraulic gynecological bondage chair that you could be strapped down to. So someone getting their penis examined basically, or? Oh, it could be anything. So it's like a vibrating chair and no, also it's just a, when I hydraulic means it goes up and down, just like if you're in the dentist. Uh, office. Okay. So, okay. It's, you know, you could position it in different positions. Uh, I have like a surgical light and lamp over over the okay. table to, that could be very menacing and threatening. I have a antique steel medical cabinet that has all sorts of um, tongue depressors and scopes and stethoscopes and um things that you can use for like prostate exam Mm -hmm. uh, speculums sounds yeah so all of the medical tools and toys i do have iv pumps 
Mm. I have a large collection of enema bags. I have catheters. Wow. Um, I have done things in in my medical scenes that are pretty extreme. Needle play, scalpel play, suturing, uh, saline breast infusion, saline scrotal infusion. Yeah. So like this is like the extreme extreme. This is like, you know, on this. So like this. You, you, some, some clients actually want to be injected and like have – what technically would be a procedure, something like saline or something yeah, like that? Yeah, even if it's just like a saline injection and you're mm. saying it's a drug that you're giving them or something, yeah. you know, so just a regular shot in your arm or in your butt. Um, or it could be sort of the medical institution, you know, mm. where you've sort of been sent there for some behavior or some issue and then yeah. you're you're stuck in the, the the psych ward yeah um which can be much more of a psychological uh scenario medical scenario mm. where maybe none of that physical stuff is really happening to you um but you are trapped in this sort of medical facility and a lot of those things are threatened so while i'm capable of doing a lot of these particular scenarios uh, for some people, it's just not something they want physically done to them, but mm -hmm. they love entertaining the idea of it being a possibility. Okay. So they like the experience. They like the feeling of being in a certain medical scenario, but mm -hmm. not the full procedure mm -hmm. or like feeling like something's being physically manipulated. They like the exactly. psychological manipulation. Exactly. And then there's, then there's a like more extreme feminization. So mm. that could play into the medical because they want to be given breasts or a vagina. And how do you, how do you, so I'm assuming these, are, these are just like, are they kind of your type A dudes, like muscular kind of in control all the time that want to be feminized? Um, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. I, I, I'd say in general, most of the clients that I have um, are more your type A and okay. do use our time together to not be that. Okay. Uh, but that's not not everybody. It's yeah. not it's not across it's not across the board. So how would you give a client who's a guy breasts? Like how does that work? So when we're talking medical, mm -hmm. there's I mean there's the regular way which would just be breast forms which you put in a bra. Mm -hmm. Just like you can buy them pretty much anywhere. Yeah. So. You know, that's normally, Party city. There you go. normally, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's normally how you would do it for just a regular feminization session. Yeah. But if someone's into heavy medical play and has the feminization aspect to it, you can actually give them breasts with saline, like an IV bag of saline into the the breast. Really? And it gives them breasts for about 24 like hours. 24 hour breasts yeah. with saline. Yeah. Wow. So, and they, they are real, you know, like it's under yeah. the skin. They feel like real breasts. They look like real breasts. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's like you're full in for yeah, a that's, 24 that's, hour play. That's like, you, like you can't just, you can't just like deflate them nope. at the door. You're like, all right, I'm rocking these You'll be well hydrated for... afterwards though. Yes. Probably going to be in chastity or some other kind of thing. So you'll yeah. be peeing a lot. It's great. You know? <laughs> it, so if you're doing, whether it whether it's an extreme medical situation like the the saline knockers or mm -hmm. there's uh I'm just trying to think like if it's extreme or whether it's something that's more it you're could just be, in the seat it could be like this the kid wanting to go see the school nurse and the mm. the most aggressive thing that happens is maybe they have their rectal temperature taken maybe yeah you know so it could be literally that that different yeah. And that's uh, useful, too, because if you're getting your temperature taken, you might actually find out you're sick at the time. And you're like, oh, <laughs> which, this is, this is, this is more than just play. Yes, yeah, exactly. Two seconds COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah that would be funny if you like, I take someone's rectal temperature and you're like, oh, I think you might actually have to get checked. This is like 102. Um, but yeah, is, is there something that clients express to you that do the medical play that gives you an insight why they like it so much like what what is the thing that makes them feel fulfilled or, or makes them feel better walking out the door when they're doing the medical play sure i think like any thing that brings somebody to me um some people have an interest in it because maybe they had an experience that was scary in the past mm -hmm. or where they felt out of control in the past and this is their way of 
sort of sexualizing it and making it positive. Yeah. It's a way of confronting fears. Mm. Um, if, if people are scared to go to the doctor, what better way to kind of confront that fear than doing it in this capacity? Yeah. Um, because, you know, when we can sexualize something, it releases all these hormones in our brain and it, it makes us feel differently about the situation. Mm. So... Uh, and for some people, it's just sort of like the power exchange. So you, you yeah. know the dynamic. If you're coming to the doctor's office, you understand the roles. So it's a really quick way for them to get out of their normal headspace yeah. and let go of being in control. Because you know when you go to the doctor's office, you're you know you're deferring to the expert, and yeah. it's sort of ingrained in us ever since we were children that when we're in that dynamic, you know, you listen to what the doctor says. Yeah. So if you have a hard time letting go of being in control, putting yourself in a role play scenario where you're the patient patient you know what it's like to be a patient mm. so it automatically helps your brain shift out of the being in control mode um so it's just an avenue for some people to experience that yeah, easily that, that makes sense because it's like a repetition of doing the thing that makes you nervous or feel out of control but you're in a very controlled environment and it's a playful version mm -hmm. of the thing that traumatizes you or makes you feel off for whatever reason I, I saw this vice documentary on bdsm with trauma recovery or, mm -hmm. or trauma treatment and that documentary mentions a lot of the same thing or, or similar things um but it walks through this couple where the the woman had a past sexual assault and she was using bdsm as a way to get through the sexual assault like i i believe the way she described it was using kink to catalyze uh working through the trauma yeah and so th there were things that she wanted done to her to like almost reclaim what had happened to her in that controlled setting and she was having her boyfriend do all these things and i thought that was really cool because that's a part of it that i never thought about where if, if you're having things that other people may perceive as extreme or like what is going on here this you know this is weird what's wrong with you why would you want this done to you you may want to do it because you just like it and it's fun and that's what makes you feel better or you're working through something like trauma and this gives you kind of like the dose of what happened to you or the dose of the thing that makes you feel out of control yeah and for some people that's definitely why yeah. they they gravitate towards it and some people don't know why like it's like why do you have a foot fetish why do you have a this or that or whatever that you're attracted to some people just are really excited about medical procedures or you know that the the gear the equipment and they might not have a particular memory or reason why yeah. Uh, sometimes searching for that answer is really frustrating for people because they're like, why am I like this? And it's yeah. like, I've just realized like some people are wired like it. I think about like, why did those pictures when I was 12 or 13 speak to me so much? Yeah. I, I you know, I don't know why they just did. I saw them and I was like, yeah, I, I relate. Yeah. I, I feel like sometimes you don't even have to know why. If, if you find something that makes you feel good and it's not hurting anyone else then why you know what's the reason to not exactly. do that as long as you know you can do it long term and it's not gonna be something that kills you or is extremely harmful to you like what I, I feel like oh, sometimes over analyzing it may lead you down a path where you're just overthinking it way more than you you have to and then you kind of psych yourself out of it i've done that sometimes where i'm like what well, just thinking about something related to podcasting or relationships and i'm like i know that this makes me feel good and and this is something that me and my partner enjoy doing or like whether it's uh any situation and overthinking it too much almost like takes you out of it instead of just being like all right let's just let's just, just do, do this it. yeah exactly sometimes it's fun to just be like let let's have some fun and yeah. not have to have an answer as as to why like just accept yourself yeah and that as a part of who you are yeah this week was the first week going through all this stuff with bdsm that i actually thought about why I like my fingernail squeeze because that's always been like a weird thing that I've had. I love having my fingernail squeeze and I love 
doing it to someone else that will let me do it because <laughs> most people stop after like two they're just like you're never doing this again i'm like sorry i got carried away and i was like genuinely sitting there thinking like why do i like my fingernail squeeze and then eventually i was like i guess i just, just it's just do. a sensation that i enjoy, enjoy. yeah um, I mean, that's one thing that's also great about kink is it opens people up to sensations that they would probably never experience otherwise yeah. and find enjoyment in them. Yeah. It's, do you ever get reached out to by psychologists or, or people that are interested in getting data related to kink or people's people's uh, preferences in that area? Because you're you've been doing this for 30 years you have so many data points of something that people don't really talk about in public like people would probably be blown away by the things that you tell the average person like yeah people like this people have this done to them do you ever get people I that wish. are interested in research and I reach out wish. to you and be like tell me like all the shit that people like to do that they don't talk about it is such a shame i know some ridiculously intelligent people in this industry who are getting doctorates and uh, PhDs, and they struggle, struggle, struggle so hard to get um, any topics involving kink or BDSM mm. or sex approved. So finding, even if people are really interested in it, somebody who is willing to take the time to research it because there's no funding behind it yeah. is almost impossible. Like we like to think that we're in this super open society where everything is there and accessible, but still when we look at our education um, system, it still is really reserved when it comes to this sort of stuff. Mm. I mean, even like, I mean, not to get on a whole sort of male, white, cis, blah, blah, blah yeah. sort of path, but even if you just look at non kink -related Related medical stuff like most of the studies are done on men yeah. so it's like a heart attack all the things you hear about how a heart attack feels or the warning signs have been done on men if you dig a little deeper you realize women one of the reasons why a lot of times heart attacks are more deadly is because they have very different symptoms but they're not mm. part of the most of the studies yeah. so if we can't even get that like having someone like research kink it's unfortunately we're just not there yet yeah what do you think that is though because there are studies that go deep into sex like the what what is it the master's orgasm yeah. study yeah, I mean, back that was a long time ago yeah. though you know i mean think about and the thing is that's the thing a lot of the the research is is done then and there are smaller studies but it's just still hard to fight yeah. against that i actually wrote a rough draft of a book during COVID about the health benefits of BDSM. Mm. So I hired a research assistant and, you know, she really helped in finding all of these super interesting studies that people yeah. did do, but they're few and far between and they're challenging. And also, I mean, if you're going to do a real like sort of medical study and not just a person's opinion, you need to not only have the person on the top, but on the bottom. So you mm. really have to coordinate and set things up. Yeah. So logistically, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah, I mean, but we we study people, we give drugs to people, like we do crazy shit to people in scientific settings. And this is something that would not even be close to the most extreme things that uh, like someone's underwent in terms of like, having someone take meth or like the tuskegee syphilis experiments mm -hmm. like all the 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 stuff we've done or and I, i'm saying like we like i have my md just the, the things that uh <laughs> the things that have been done in the medical industry it seems like kink and bdsm and studying that in a connection to human psychology would be such an untapped resource because like the motivations behind why people may want to be tortured or experience pain in a controlled setting or whether it's you know psychological physical like all these things that are just pushed underground in terms of human behavior i'm sure if people started funding research like this we would understand that like human motivation so much better definitely i mean until recently um people who practice kink 
were considered to have a mental disorder. It's really <laughs> yes. This is literally within the past, like, I think five years, they've actually changed it in the AMA where it's not a, a mental disorder anymore. But that's how the entire industry was seen. So you know, I think it would be wonderful if there were more people who are willing to take that dive. And I've been saying for years, ever since I really started getting into like biohacking and stuff, yeah. if there's anybody out there that wants to do like cortisol tests and wear like heart rate monitors and do yeah. blood sugar tests. And I mean, I'm all about it. I, I'd be like, the, I love medical. Yeah. So I'd be like, I'll find but this stuff. So if anybody else there yeah, wants any to do it, contact me, please. Any, I want to be uh, any elaborate. Any scientists, researchers uh, <laughs> that are that want to study kink and have an FR, fMRI machine or something like that, uh, reach really, out to Natalie. Really interesting. Um, I was talking to a colleague of mine and she told me a story and I think it plays into the research that I found and this was just a very um, sort of relevant thing where in play, she was actually able to uh, sort of see somebody's blood sugar and what it did, mm. you know, during, during, and they had blood sugar issues. And it, it, the overall takeaway was that their blood sugar was more stable and normal after play for a long period of time. Wow. Um, and that probably has to do with like cortisol and, you know, sort of hormones in their body that were able to stabilize their, their yeah. blood sugar more. But I think more people should look into sort of the physical things that happen to people when they participate and maybe there would be more acceptance and understanding as to why people do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at people who like to play sports or um, do activities that maybe would con be considered physically challenging. Mm. And all of that's fine. Like you can run your marathon and you can, you know, swim around Manhattan and do your Tough Mudder and everyone's going to pat you on the back. But if you want to push yourself physically in BDSM, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. And and I know you've talked about this on your YouTube channel, too. And it made me think a lot about why we're more accepting of certain types of pains like you yeah. mentioned the the running marathons off to the side i have a bunch of dumbbells kettlebells mm -hmm. yeah. maces like i i put myself through pain in the form of workouts because it makes me feel good mm -hmm. in the long run like yeah. short term a lot of workouts suck and it's like i'm going to endure this though because mm -hmm. i'm going to be better coming out the other side so why is that like if i just completely bl break down my body and run 26 miles like it's horrible. Like physically, it like completely decimates you. But yeah. that's put on a, a pedestal as a form of pain that is praised. Mm -hmm. So it's just like we're so people like to think that we're so open as a society. But when it comes to things that are sexual or in line with BDSM, we're weirdly puritanical. Like we're yeah. very open with some things. But then with other things, it's like, don't even touch that. Like, if you touch this, you're weird or, or something's wrong with you. And there are plenty of people out there who are like, well, I don't want anyone, you know, to do any kinky BDSM stuff. And I don't want to run a marathon. And I don't yeah. want to push my body, which, which is fine as well. But I like to talk about sort of the, the context of pain. So it's one of those things where, say, you know, I use the example of your kid in school and someone pulls your hair, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's sitting behind you at the desk, pull your hair. You turn around, you want to like, you know, yell at them, yeah. bang them, whatever. But if you're in the throes of passion and you grab your lover's hair and pull it, they might be like more, more, more. Yeah. So the it's the context behind why it's being done. So just because you might not want to run a marathon or think that you might want to be beat, there might be certain kinds of pain, you know, that you like, you know, city twister, you know, that, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. But again, depends on the context. It, it, yeah. ex exactly. Is it like your, your friend and you're out, you know, playing yeah. beer pong or whatever yeah. and they're doing it, or is it in, in the bedroom? So yeah. It, it, we really have to understand that how we perceive pain is completely subjective as to the context and the intention. Like mm -hmm. even masochists who can really be aroused by pain, they would avoid pain where it's like you broke your arm. Like that's never going to be erotic because mm -hmm. there's something wrong. Yeah. So if you're sick 
and, you know, you have food poisoning or you, you know, hurt yourself. Like, that's never going to be good pain. You're always going to feel crappy with that kind of pain. Yeah. But if you... The, if the context behind the pain is positive, then the sensation will be more positive. Mm. And there's like neutral pain, like you want to get a tattoo. Okay, it might not be the best feeling in the world, but you want it, so you endure it. Or yeah. you know that the shot you're going to be given might help you, you know, w- whatever it is. So really the psychological component of pain pays such a huge role into yeah how you perceive it and why you may want it. So – Let's take something like nipple torture. If you're enduring nipple torture, is there a point where it starts to feel good or is it just constant pain? Because I'm just wondering, I, I was in a cold tub yesterday. I went, went to a Russian bathhouse. You like, brave did, did, person. I hate did the, the cold. Did the that cold tub. The I, I've, I've, never, I've never been in a tub uh, that cold before. I think it was like 41 degrees, oh, something crazy. Um and so I was doing that in between the sauna mm-hmm. and then two or three, like the first minute felt like pins and needles. And then two or three minutes in, I was like, oh, this is how people die. That's that starts <laughs> to feel good in a cult. Like literally my mind was like, oh, like you want this, like stay, stay in. And I felt myself almost becoming warmer a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I was there with my brother and I, I told him, I was like, this is how people die in cult. Like they literally just stay in too long. And then it starts to feel it's you start to turn a corner at a certain point where it's like the endorphins kick yep. in. Does, does that same thing apply to something like play or nipple torture or whatever it is? I think with any um, physical play of any kind that could be perceived as painful at a certain point, if you, I, I have found generally, if you ease into it, number one, um, the, the lighter version of it might feel very erotic Mm-hmm. which will then get all of the, you know, endorphins going and all the yeah. dopamine and the cereal, all the, the, the good feel stuff. good stuff yeah. will start coming out. And then once you have those things in your brain, you know, it's like blocks the pain receptors and it starts to make you feel good. So you're able to take more and mm. more and more. So it's sort of this chemical response in your brain. Um, if you start slow and then you can really build up to, if you started at that point that you got to in the beginning, mm-hmm. it would be horrible. Yeah. But if there's a progression, then even something that would be very painful in the beginning starts to feel really, really good because yeah. there's a lot of other stuff going on. Now, of course, there's the tipping point where that can be too much as well. Yeah, like diminishing returns. You know, there there's definitely a tipping point. And for men, definitely once the orgasm happens, that's it. You're done. Like you could be, yeah. you know. But even before that, it could it gets to a point where your body still says yeah. such and such is too much. Um, you know, some people like to do like you said, nipple play. And you might start out with literally the lightest touch on the mm-hmm. planet and by the end have really, really strong clamps on because mm-hmm. there's all these other things going on in their body and the yeah. message is received as pleasurable. Yeah. When there is an orgasm involved, is, is there ever sex involved in a session? Like how does that happen? Like do you facilitate it? Does it just like happen on its own or – Everybody in kink, you know, obviously, if they're doing it professionally or personally, sex can or can't be involved. It's mm-hmm. really going to be up to the participants. Um, some people, even if it's in a non-professional, you know, situation, don't want sex to be involved in kink. They're mm-hmm. just very different, vanilla sex and kink. But yeah. they very well can be intermixed. Yeah. Um Professionally, I don't have sex with my clients, but I know that there are women out there in my industry who do both have sex and not, and mm. that's their particular choice, and there's nothing right or wrong about about either one. Mm-hmm. Um, when I got into this industry, there was a very distinct difference between escorting and dom work. It mm. was like two sides, yeah. <laughs> sort of the same. Like it just they didn't they didn't blend together yeah um so that's just sort of how i was brought up in the industry and i find for for me personally it's just something that hasn't been involved in in my play Mm. um but i think that one of the things that's really interesting about that and kink is if you take away the element of sex traditional sex Mm. um 
You open people up to explore intimacy, sexuality, sensation on levels that they never knew existed. Mm. So it's really interesting because it opens people up to all of these other sensations and ways of being intimate with somebody that doesn't involve sex. Yeah. And I think we're taught that, you know, sex is the most intimate sort of interaction, but I have found and heard from a lot of people that their BDSM kink and play is more intimate than a lot of the sex that they've had yeah. because of the trust level and the communication and the pushing of boundaries and all of the other things that are involved with it. Mm. Uh, also, I think for men, it's interesting. Uh, I'm, this is changing, which is great, but most of my clients are older. I'm older, so I'm dealing with a very different um, age group. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of the people that I see are at least my age, in, but into their sixties mm -hmm. and and so on. So you know, you're kind of told when you're younger, you know, a lot of your manhood, who you are as a person, is kind of wrapped up in your dick, and if it can get hard, you know, mm -hmm. that's just like. Guys. Oh yeah, and, and, and you get that on uh, podcast ads too. The the blue chew. The yeah, whatever, yeah, you know, and it's it's a thing in our society. It's like that's and eventually, like, and sometimes earlier for some people and medical conditions and all this stuff that might not be available to you. Mm. And I have seen some people, um, not so much in kink, but outside of kink, really get depressed and have all of these issues when they start to lose their their libido or their ability to have erections like they used to. They feel like less of a man, less of a person. But when you take that dynamic out and you start to play around with all this other stuff, especially at a younger age, yeah. it's like, okay, so my entire you know ego is not wrapped up on if my dick gets hard or not. Yeah, And you open up yourself and your potential partners to a whole bunch of other things. Mm. And I think that's one of the great things about kink is it it can take away that aspect of it. So it's almost like it, it could be a sexual recharging of a guy who's older, like maybe he just doesn't get hard like he mm -hmm. used to anymore. Few and far between. And then BDSM and kink could be like another outlet an, another path to getting to the orgasm. sexual expression yeah it doesn't even have to be orgasm because some people yeah. can't so or just feeling turned on in a way yeah it, it's a, it's a way to be sexual and a way mm. to be intimate and that is something i think everybody can open themselves up to at any age mm. um and realize that hey sex and intimacy my sexual expression the things that feel good do not have to only involve traditional mm. traditional sex how much does porn affect what you do do you get people that come to you seeing bdsm style porn or, or things in kink where they just want to go super hard right away or they have these maybe unrealistic unrealistic expectations of things like did you find that porn is almost leaks over in some ways of what people expect. Yeah, and, and not just porn. I mean, honestly, probably more so from just social media in general. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe not so much Instagram because that's pretty tame, but like Twitter and things of that. So a lot of the people who come to, the newer people who come to me, um, because it is so accessible, they see this really extreme stuff. Like, mm. because everyone wants to post the craziest thing they've done. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, Twi no. Twitter's a free for all. <laughs> yeah, Instagram is light. Instagram, you get taken down for like yes. part of a nipple, but Twitter is like full go. Right. And 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 porn and other just, yeah. I mean, there's a million avenues to, to see kink and BDSM now. So everyone puts out the most extreme thing and people are exposed to this. So they think like right off the bat, like, I want to do this. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, you really don't. It's, yeah, it, they it walk in and good. they're like, we're the electric butt plugs, like, let's go. And you you're know, just like, what's your name? Like, yes, let's start there. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so it is interesting, especially again, because I've been here for decades from where there the advertisement didn't even have a photo of you in, mm. in the beginning. There's no pictures. It was like a one word ad 
in a magazine, like role play and a number. And that's all you got. That's mm. all you got. <laughs> so your expectations and what was shown to you was like so mind blowing, even if it would have been super, super simple because it was yeah. out of the norm. And now you're exposed. So people come in and, you know, I have a pretty regimented like you know, submission form you have to fill in and a consultation and all of that, all mm. of that sort of stuff. And sometimes I'll read these things and I'm like, no, this is not where we start. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not the beginning. Yeah. This is like, like you're, chapter you're 15. already, this guy's already at uh, Club Vandersex from Eurotrip. Like, you gotta exactly. start easy. <laughs> so, and I, in a weird way, it makes me a little sad because I just realize it's generationally like people are when you're exposed to so much like how do you find what's new and different mm. how do you find that thing that's super exciting that you haven't seen yeah um and i'm like i don't know what that's like because when i was younger we didn't have any of that so all of this was just so mind-blowing to me mm. um and now i just you know, people's perceptions, they're just exposed to, to a lot more. Yeah. I, I imagine that completely changes the dynamic when you have someone who maybe has watched a hundred hours of BDSM online before they even come to the yeah. first session. And then you flip that on its head and, and you saw a session live for the first time. So you didn't have like this just in-depth research, like expectation like you didn't have an expectation no expectations and that's what i tell yeah. people i was like come in with no expectations and you'll yeah. be happy yeah because you know if you think that you're gonna if you think you want all of that stuff not that i'm not saying we can't work towards it because that's awesome like if you have goals and you have things that really mm -hmm. speak to you um but people then think like if they can't take it or if it didn't work for them or it wasn't what they really liked they feel like it's sort of a failure and they might not try it again mm. and i find with bdsm and kink and all of this self-exploration you have to be really open to just having the experience mm. and letting whatever and not judging it before it even happens mm. do you ever do, do you think about the metaverse and the future of bdsm like let's say <laughs> 20 years from now half of bdsm clients are putting on an oculus headset and they're like attaching nipple tasers or like they're they're watching someone spank them and they're like they have something like yeah. spank themselves like uh, honestly, is it already it, starting to it's already like starting. is there anything like that like zoom I mean, bdsm or i don't think there's anything quite like that but i do know that there, the oculus is tons of porn and yeah. all of that sort of stuff but i i don't know um i obviously i'm way more uh of an in-person kind yeah. of person i imagine it would be hard to replicate like the the feeling of even if you feel like you're in the room which feels so weird because i've seen some of the demonstrations in a conference room and you have the figures that like the, the fact that they almost look human makes it weirder it's like i'd yeah. rather you be a complete avatar or <laughs> look like a human you're just like this almost person in this conference room space turning and having a 360 view i i imagine i mean i'm sure it's going to happen where like everything else bdsm is going to enter that space of the the augmented reality but it just i don't know i i don't want to be in that world like if that's what podcasting turned you to like 80 percent augmented reality I, I just i feel like i would miss the in-person interaction and it would never completely replicate it it, it would just kind of feel like this almost thing yeah i mean obviously during covid i wasn't really able to work much and i wasn't able to translate a lot to virtual but when I did, it's still like there is something missing. Yeah. You know, there is the energy that you literally pick up from another person that is sitting next to you. Yeah. I, I imagine it takes away from the playfulness when you have BDSM buffering and you're just like, wait, what did, what did you just call me? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and no, it happened. Just, yeah. like, oh. You're like, I said. <laughs> I'm going to have to start. I'm going to have to reboot. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I think we're about an hour in right mm -hmm. now. I feel like this would be a good time oh, to go through some of the, I, the I, toys and explain how some, some of these, are, some is, these so, are used. Yes. Um, 
You had asked, what are some of my favorite implements? And that's really challenging, especially since some of them are huge pieces of furniture that I wasn't yes. able to bring here. But really, the first thing that came to mind were my hands. Mm. Honestly, um, they are the best tool and best toy ever. Yeah. And as much gear as I have, and do I have a ton of gear, I find myself using my hands more than anything mm. because it can be the lightest of light touch it can be really really firm touch it could be something to close somebody's eyes or put a hand around a throat or mm. over a mouth or you know spreading body parts apart or yeah. wh whatever it is so honestly i think my hands are my most favorite tool for sure so hands number one hands are number one and that you can bring with you anywhere yes and um yeah yeah, so you know, grabbing somebody by the balls, literally. Yeah. I mean, there's just there's something very tactile about that. Yeah. And there's leather gear and all this equipment to give the same effect. Rope, mm. this, that, the other thing. But like there's just something about that connection. Um, so yeah. Hands, favorite tool. And then you have the the maintenance. I'm sure you you keep them, you know, nice and uh, conditioned. <laughs> I, I try. They, they're your number I, one tools of the trade. <laughs> I used to rock climb, so it was a little hard, but you know, yeah. I don't do that anymore. So they're, they're definitely a little softer, but you know, sometimes the rough, the callus thing I was going to say may add burning, to the effect. Hit yeah. yeah. I, you know, and it doesn't hurt me. There you go. You got the built in ridges. You don't need the, the paddle. <laughs> exactly. Um, and speaking of which, yeah, paddle, paddle I brought, uh, again, because it's one of those things that obviously can be used for heavier mm -hmm. play, but in the same um, line, you could use it really lightly. You know, yeah. it could be simple and for, those of you for its effect of it, just being in a position, say, over somebody's lap, like mm -hmm. you already feel vulnerable, you know. Yeah. And, and for those of you just listening right now, this is what, about probably like a eight to 10 inch leather paddle, yeah, so medium size, you I, know. I, I would say that the hitting part of it is about six inches. Okay. And then the handle is probably about five. Almost looks like a roundish spatula, like a round leather, but not no like uh, holes or anything no. in it. Like you could use it to flip a burger exactly. if you had to. <laughs> if you had to. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it could be super light and you can also use it literally on parts of the body just to threaten or touch like you mm. run it like on the crease of a neck or the down the spine of a back and then r just rub the paddle across yeah. the skin you don't even it's have like to the, hit like with the it. anticipation it's of like, it am i going to am i not going to yeah. so a paddle or some sort of implement like this is always a lot of yeah. fun for use or for mm. for threatening um then since we talked about taking taking the oh, cock this, uh, out of chastity? the equation, one of my favorite tools <laughs> All right, let's, let's is chastity it. here. Uh, and there's a million versions. Surprise, I'm wearing one right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's a million versions that you can have them custom made yeah. to fit you well for like, especially if you want to wear it for longer than a few hours. Um so this is a a, a chastity, what a chastity belt or device, yeah, what would you call a, a this? Chastity device. And it's the shape. It's a plastic. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take chastity. it apart. Yeah, yeah it so, looks like the head of a penis is like the the shape of this plastic. Yeah. So it this has an internal lock where the lock sits in. Mm. Some of the other ones have a lock that you can loop through, and these come in all different sizes. This one I just grabbed it because it was the first one. Yeah. So they come in the smaller version and then you know bigger depending. Yeah. And then there's the part that would go around the base of your cock. Oh, now, boy. <laughs> I like this one. And, and you, oh, boy, when I opened it up. But this is kind because okay. a lot of the other ones that are solid, you have to feed the penis through and then pop your balls through, which can be really challenging yeah. for some people if you have sensitive testicles. Mm. But if it's too big, it'll slip off. Mm. So this one's great because it actually opens so you could just go and close it around without having to manipulate your cock and balls through it, which can okay. be more way more so uncomfortable. So more, more adjustable. So this is better. And also there's lots of different sizes. So, yeah. you know, it's really highly adjustable as to, oh, wow. as to which ones. And these, again, come in like four or five different sizes of length. Most of them don't have a big 
different uh, size of the the girth of it. Mm. Um, so for for that again, there's like custom and different companies come yeah. in all different sizes. This was just one that I pulled out that I really enjoy, even if it's for temporary wear. Yeah, uh, psychologically, it's a total mind fuck. Okay. So. <laughs> It's just awesome. Like you're you're locked in there. You yeah. can't get a boner. Like you you're just you well you can, but it's a little it's, it's hard. Like on a scale of one to ten, how painful would it be to have full blood flow while you're in one of these cock cages? Like, is it super painful? Does it does it stop it from getting to the painful point because it's so restrictive? Or you like, know, how does that work? It would be really. It would depend on the size. So, mm. if you really wanted it to be restrictive, you would mm. buy a very small size that was pretty tight on you when you were flaccid. Mm. So then. When you're really aroused, like you're struggling yeah. against that. But if you buy a size that you have some room, then as you get to h- harder, you can get hard in the chastity and have it be relatively comfortable, mm. relatively speaking. Like you know you're locked up, you're kind of struggling against it, but it's not like your skin is like poking out every little available crevice yeah so it depends and i'll uh if you allow me i'll take a picture of these before yeah. you leave so if you guys are listening to it and you want to see you can check out the the youtube version I'll, I'll throw it up there for this part but it's uh it's 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 intense it, it definitely <laughs> looks like it does the job like to not get a full boner you are locked in a literal yeah cock cage and then um my my other favorite is my strap on harness, and this one is probably like fifteen years old. Oh wow! Still still holding up really well. I, <laughs> they I don't actually, make it anymore. It's I my actually favorite wrote, one. I actually wrote down a quote from the bio on your website where I was like, "This would be the great <laughs> a, a great first line of a of your autobiography if you ever decided to write one." I was 18 when I wore a strap on for the first time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. And I was like, there it is. Like, that's like (laughs) you open the book in Barnes and Nobles and you're like, all right, like I either I'm going to love or hate this book, but I'm going to check it out. Which is probably why I had to bring um, my 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 strap on, which is one of my favorite, 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 favorite things on the planet. Um, And obviously the the power exchange role reversal Mm -hmm. of uh, wearing a strap on, you really can't. Uh, get around that at yeah. all. So are you wearing this most of the time? It, will guys put this over themselves or is no, it so mostly I, just for I you? Wear this. Okay. And basically this is for either actual pe- pegging mm-hmm. or threatening because sometimes the look of it and the threat of it is again just mm-hmm. as powerful. Um also oral cock sucking so yeah. you know it, again slut play um role reversal like getting a guy on his knees and having him suck my cock is just really kind of hot and and this is yeah yeah <laughs> and the thing is they a lot of people will perceive this as the person on the bottom is either bisexual or gay or wants this to be a man's cock or mm. whatever sometimes that there, that's part of it and mm-hmm. that's great and wonderful but sometimes it's really not you know it's really about a woman taking charge and turning the tables on a man yeah i was gonna say like how how much is your kink or your fetish a part of your sexuality like does make it, does wanting to have a dildo in your mouth and like go down on a strap on make you gay or make you like does does that feed in line with your sexuality at all? Or do people are just like, no, that's completely different. Like this is, this is my strap on time. And then outside of this, like I have sex with women or whoever you want to have sex with. Like they're, they're not overlapped. Like, is it both or is, is it one? It, of the- it is a, a spectrum for, mm. for people who enjoy strap on play for, for some people, you know, they can be any orientation. Mm. Um, just because you enjoy it, doesn't mean at all that you want it to be a man who's doing it. You are attracted to a woman who's wearing yeah. a strap on. So if it was a guy, that's a completely different dynamic. Mm. Now, for some people, they fantasize or are curious about being with a guy. So they might have a woman sort of 
replicate what it would be like if it yeah. was a guy. But for some, they really want it to be a woman and to submit to a woman that way or explore their sexuality that way and see just what it's like to be sort of on the other side. Yeah. You know, but they have no interest in men, but it's still a curiosity. Yeah. And again, you think about the power exchange of this is something that a guy always does. He's the one that's in that mm -hmm. position. So what's it like to not be in that position? So is the strap on something you would use? You, you said the slut training that that's mm -hmm. like the feminization mm -hmm. where the guy comes in and he'll either have the, the full on silicone uh, tits or the uh, I guess another device for the breasts, like fake breasts or something like that, like or whatever and for, gets them for, into that feminism for some, state. It's even just a pair of panties, like that's yeah. enough. You know, that's enough feminization. And again, it's it's interesting because so women we quote unquote cross dress all the time. I can wear pants and I can wear a suit and I can wear all of that stuff and it's just durigar. We just walk around like that. Yeah. Not a big deal. In our society, men still really can't wear women's clothes. Mm -hmm. um it's just unless they're artistic or something and it's just it's just they can't go to work with nail polish on they they can't they can't wear skirts and so just the fact that they're doing it is exciting it's yeah. like that i want to experience i'm not allowed to do it there's something naughty about it there's something exciting about it it also takes me out of the headspace of being who i am yeah and so feminization on various level can hit so many different things. And when you start to play around with feminization, then you get into sort of the the slut training or sissy training. And also it takes away again that dynamic of you're there for your pleasure. In mm. the BDSM dynamic, there is a service component. Mm. So if I say, I want you to serve me in this way, um, then that as the submissive is their job. Mm. And sometimes the more the person is pushed, the more exciting it is. Yeah. So that person may have really no interest in sucking my strap on. Yeah. But the fact that I am saying, this is how I'm going to be pleased. This is how you're going to please me. Yeah. Then there is pleasure in the pleasing aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. That So feminization, does that equal slut training or is that just one aspect of slut training? Like what, what is slut training specifically? Well, like in it there, it's broad again. Yeah. <laughs> so, there, there's so much stuff. That's a, a word that we use or that I use in my scenes where I have a sub who I may feminize to a certain degree and kind of use them like a sex toy. So mm. they're going to be dressed up and then slutified. And it's like, Men don't get to be that, you know, yeah. you, you're not, men aren't sluts. Yeah. So to, to again, feel sort of vulnerable and be put in this feminine clothes and to be exposed and to be viewed as a sex object. Women are typically, quote unquote, viewed yeah. as sex objects, but men are not. Yeah. So there's something interesting psychologically about being viewed as a sex object. And in that sort of slut training, they're going to be used in whatever way. I, do I want to tie you up? Do I want to, you know, torture your nipples? Do I want to fuck your ass with my strap on? What What is it that I'm going to do? But you are just like this living, breathing human blow up doll. And yeah. I'm just going to objectify you in this slutty kind of way. Yeah. And going back to the, the cross dressing, that's a good point. Because if you see, if you see a girl walking down the street in dad jeans, like I don't think, oh, that's, an indictment on her sexuality like right. it's just a girl wearing dad jeans but if you're a guy walking down the street in a skirt everyone's mm -hmm. gonna think you're gay or everyone's right. gonna think you know you like taking it in the ass or like that guy loves uh whatever it is like that skirt is an indictment on that yes. dude's sexuality so there is like this kind of weird uh dynamic when it comes to cross-dressing that aspect and i really thought about it yeah and i think that's why a lot of men really enjoy it one it's still taboo which there's very few taboo things in our society so yeah. it's exciting to explore this thing that you're not supposed to do and also it does allow you to tap in to sort of emotions and and parts of yourself that uh, a lot of men are not allowed quote unquote mm -hmm. to feel you know, and whether it's vulnerable and soft, like a lot of times we'll use the word like sissy training, which mm. has, there's like slut training, which is more 
what I described before, where sissy training sort of has this more almost childlike, vulnerable, soft feeling to yeah. it. All of these emotions that are not something men are really allowed to explore. And even just the clothes, they feel different. The satins and the silks and like having that against your skin and feeling those things that society says are more feminine. Mm. It's it's an exploration in senses and mindset and emotions. Yeah. So I've I've heard you talk about the aspects of public play. Like you'll you'll mm -hmm. often take clients uh, it'll be a dinner or rock climbing or something like that, yoga class. Is there a specific example or uh, a, a session that comes to mind of a recent public play that stands out to you? Like, like for people to get an idea that really don't have any kind of clue what that is or, or can't you sure. know, imagine that. Um, there's, there's a few that come to mind and some are really simple. Like I went out to dinner and there was nothing else going on other than dinner, except when it came time to order, you know, the, the waiter came over and, you know, a lot of people still will traditionally look towards the guy towards like what wine is other thing. And, you know, he was trained to say she's in charge. So basically <laughs> <laughs> that whole night, the waiter knew like, don't ask him yeah. anything. Don't talk to him. I ordered for him. I picked the wine. You know, I had actually had his credit card. So I paid the bill. It was like, she's in charge and very subtle, yeah, but really fun. Mm. And, you know, saying that little cue right there in the beginning was, was just very exciting mm. and, and erotic. So it could be a simple as, as something like that. Um, also recently I went out and had, um, my sub wear like a vibrating butt plug. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, and was in panties. And, and so this was after the name stage, you knew his name for a long time before <laughs> the, the butt plug came into play. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. This wasn't the first session. Um, and yeah, no, definitely. I, I don't do public pay anywhere near the first session because yeah. I have to actually like, like hanging out with you socially. And yeah. so I need to know you enough that like when you're not in sub mode, we can have normal conversation, which mm. some people really can't. So yeah, it, it definitely is something that takes a little time time to get to know mm -hmm. the person to make sure but they had a vibrating butt plug and panties and stockings and a bra under their their mm. clothes so we were just having a casual dinner and it wasn't even that like she's in charge thing like we're just talking and he's ordering and i'm ordering and i'm playing on my phone with the butt plug yeah. and um so he had he had the the butt plug that was vibrating, the panties and the bra. Mm -hmm. Was he wearing a suit or something over? Yeah, like he was just wearing so a suit. people could tell that there was something under it with a bra or no, could he not no, really like see you it? You totally can't tell. I mean he had a shirt, but okay. down shirt and a jacket and it was you know, it was all under no one could tell. Yeah. So but he knew. <laughs> and, and it feels like everyone can tell because I you feel like everybody's and looking so at you. So you have you have a button or an app on your phone app or something? On my phone okay. For this particular one, yeah. Um and then more, um, more overt mm. um, was I, actually just recently this past Sunday uh, went shopping. It was uh, one of my subs who likes to take me shopping. So we went to go shoe shopping and, you know, fancy, high end, blah, blah, blah. The people who work there are very attentive. You know, yeah. they want to do the shoe and do the whole thing and blah, yeah. blah, blah. They're there down there. And I just looked at the guy. It's like, nope, he's got to do the work. So there my sub is fumbling around with these strappy Louboutin shoes mm. with his big hand trying these ten, and he's just like sweating and failing epically. And the yeah. guy's standing up for him. Like, you could tell he, and I was like, nope. And I was just like basically telling him, I was like, you're doing an awful job. And like, like everyone could hear, yeah. you know. And then um, he had his his phone off and you know, trying to pay, and the credit card was giving an alert because obviously mm. it was an expensive thing. And I look over his shoulder, and I was like, "You're on airplane mode!" And I literally just slapped him across the face, wow. <laughs> right there in front of her. Because there you I, go, you know, and that'll so, put you in airplane mode, even if you weren't in it before. <laughs> just a quick slap. You look at your phone, you're like, "Wow, so that slap actually changed over. my settings." I yeah. mean, this is like <laughs> extraordinary. Like everybody in that store knew what the f was going on. Yeah. Um. So that was extraordinarily overt 
you know, public play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So d- does anyone in the store, like, they know what's going on, but does anyone ever say something to you that's a stranger in public no. play, like, walk over to you and be no, like, because, is everything I mean, okay? In, in that situation, like, he's just, you know, messing with the shoes. I'm yeah. not I'm not yelling or screaming at him. I'm just, yeah. like, saying in a very normal tone. Yeah. Um, but obviously, as the guy comes over who's working there, or if anybody's looking, they're probably wondering, like, why is this person who obviously doesn't work here fussing yeah. with her shoes? Yeah. Is there are, are there lines that you won't cross, oh, yeah. whether it's a t- type of play mm-hmm. or humiliation? Like, what, what are those lines that just are not on your menu? You know, I have a really wide spectrum of things that I like. Um, I think compared to a lot of people in my industry, but the things that I won't do, uh, when it comes to sort of physical play is any sort of, I don't even know if you will know what these terms are. Try Um, Roman showers. Roman showers. Can I, let me try to guess what this is. (laughs) Okay. So I know golden showers getting peed on Mm -hmm. Roman shower. There was a lot of uh, what something that happened in Rome, like homoerotic peeing, <laughs> group peeing with a bunch of guys, something like that. So, so when it when it comes to showers, there's uh, golden showers, mm-hmm. brown showers, ruby showers, and Roman showers. Roman showers. Okay, okay, so these are these are the four kinds, and it's peeing, pooping, peeing when you have your period. And puking. I wish I would have paid so much more attention if these were the PowerPoint presentations <laughs> at school. Like, okay, these are the different type of showers we have, kids. All right, pay attention because you're going to need this in about five years. <laughs> so I have no problem and actually really enjoy golden showers, which okay. is also fun to do in public when you sneak your wine glass into the bathroom and bring it back to the table. But wow, anyway. okay. <laughs> that's that's uh, What would that be? Uh, a, uh, a white wine? I'm, I'm so bad with wines. A Pinot Grigio? <laughs> Pinot Grigio shower? <laughs> I don't I don't drink Pinos, but yeah, yeah. sounds fair. Um, we'll take another bottle, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Roman showers are puking. Like, I'm not going to puke on somebody. I have a phobia. That is, like, way out of my spectrum. You know, I don't really do brown showers either. Um, is that just straight up pooing, like diarrhea? Well, or not whatever diarrhea, comes but out of you, yeah. yeah. And, and again, for me, for various reasons, it's just not something I'm comfortable mm. doing. I, I don't really enjoy it. I've been around people who do it. I, I don't mind being sort of in the room, but like, it's just not something I like to do. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fine with golden showers, uh, ruby showers. Like, it's, that's there's a whole health issue when it comes to that. Then you have to be really careful. I mean, obviously not from my end, but the person trusting you because exchange of blood potentially, mm. all of that sort of stuff plays into it. So yeah, the, those that is a no go for me. And then when it comes to humiliation, over the years I've played around, especially you know thirty years ago, with lots of different kinds of humiliation. Mm. But at this point in my life, I am really not comfortable with any sort of race humiliation or Mm. religious humiliation and i'm definitely not into um sort of fat shaming um Mm. well yeah i imagine your your connection with and it's interesting because i don't mind doing motivational sort of fat shaming in a way like because i have used that but i've had some people who were over weight and wants it to be like force fed Mm. and like i just can't be a part of that negative like it's sort of like uh, if it's oh so like they want to get more fat they don't want to use it to yeah or just fat shaming in general like if it's a boot camp style Mm. like fat shaming where you need to be yelled at yeah like i could do that that's fine if i understand the intention behind it yeah um, so that, that sort of humiliation, just, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. It doesn't flow yeah. naturally for me. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a no go, um, no smoking. Uh, it's like one, my studio is carpet and drapery and all that stuff. And I just don't think it's healthy and I hate the way it smells oh, yeah. and all of that sort of stuff. So, so no, no smoking fetishes on, on my end. Um, I think... That's about it, though. That still leaves uh, a lot open. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot, it does. Pretty wide open. The the contracts, are like the the fat shaming. I, I've heard you talk about the contracts a little bit. Mm-hmm. That to me seems super interesting because 
one, like we're in the most fat positive society Mm -hmm. we've ever been in. Yeah, we have. And I imagine the, like, like I'm someone who likes reinforcement that uh, paired with fitness, like Mm -hmm. coming from a very athletic background, played baseball for like 20 years all through college. Like I was not someone who responded well uh, with baseball skills or whatever we were doing in the gym, lifting weights. Like if you were like, great job, like I would be like, all right, whatever. But if you were like, stop being a bitch, like get this weight (laughs) up. I'd be like, "Mm." Like, (laughs) so I like, I completely understand uh, the desire for, I don't even know if negative reinforcement is the right term for it, but just taking jabs at someone verbally to inspire them to lift a certain weight or go to the gym in the first place and do like ha- how have successful contracts worked for you in the past like working with a client yeah they're they're completely different and that's why usually before i do any sort of contract i need to know them because i need to understand what is going to motivate them yeah because some people do need you're doing a great job i'm really p- proud of you keep it going this is exactly what i want to see and other people are like don't be a pussy. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. This is shit. You could do better. Yeah. You know, how even da- just hearing that, I'm like, oh, how fuck. dare you bring this shit in front of me? This yeah. is pathetic. You know, it's yeah. like, so you really need to know what is going to motivate the person. Yeah. Um, because I, you don't want to get that wrong mm. because a lot of people could be really insulted, like for real, not for play. Yeah. Um, if you use the wrong approach and, I always say that no matter how humiliating or painful or degrading what I do is, the person needs to leave me feeling better than Mm. when they walked in. Yeah. Um, So it's my job to figure out how to facilitate that. Yeah, how to get them to that point. Of of what we do. Yeah. Is there, what are some examples of something that might happen if someone, whatever the contract was, if they didn't, go to the gym or maybe they overate or something they didn't get their calorie count that week how would you incentivize someone to do that through bdsm yeah again i would we would need to talk about what things motivate them Mm -hmm. for real and what real realistic punishments or disciplinary Mm -hmm. actions are um for some people it would be like you have to pay me for my session but don't get to see me you know, mm, so like taking it away. Yeah. Or um, we have X, Y, and Z. And the reward is we go out to this fancy dinner together, you know, dressed in your clothes that you now fit in, yada, yada. And if you don't meet those goals, well, then that dinner is like off the table and I get mm. to go with my friend because, you know, the reservation needed to be made six months in yeah. advance and you're paying for it. And sorry, yeah. you didn't make it. Um, so those are certain motivations. Also, some people want to be pushed with things that they really don't like. That mm. really helps. Like if somebody say has super sensitive nipples. And that's like a sort of hard limit for them where Mm -hmm. they they don't – they really do not want that as part of their play. But that is the motivator. Like if you do not achieve your goals, I'm going to put clamps on your nipples. And so it depends on the person. (laughs) It depends – it really depends on the person like what's going to motivate them more to to do something because for some people – one would be like, oh, no big deal. I don't care if you go out to dinner with your friends. Have fun. Enjoy. Yeah. And the other person would be like, you know, nipple clamps. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you really have to know who you're dealing with and and talk to them and, yeah. and figure out what works and what doesn't work and what's realistic and not. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's so much talk about fat shaming nowadays. And when I when I've thought about it recently, like if if I hear about fat shaming or, you know, I'm not for just going up to strangers and being like, you're fat, like change your life. Like that's terrible. You should never do that to a person. But when you say that fat shaming is not acceptable in any form, there are some people that really do respond to that. And Mm -hmm. myself being one of those people where I'm like, I get motivated buy shameful things with fitness much Mm -hmm. more than someone just showering me with praise about how good I look and things like that. So I feel like in a way, the fat shame discussion disregards an entire segment of society that just does not respond to positivity nearly as well as they do something that's 
shameful or, or humiliating, embarrassing, whatever it is. Well, see, that's really relevant to kink because these things that most people in the broad spectrum would be like, oh, that's horrible. How can you say that to somebody? How could you do yeah. that to somebody? But for some people, they respond really, really well to it. Yeah. And who are you to decide what sh what is right for that person and what's not right for that yeah. person? What, what should make them feel good and make them not feel good? And being conscientious about people in general is extraordinarily important and being empathetic and listening and understanding. But I don't think we should have the right to tell somebody that blanket statement something is good or bad. Yeah. See, this is why we need scientists running these studies <laughs> to have like a, a BDSM fitness crossover and actually see what it does to people's brains or like how they respond to it, losing weight, getting healthier, things like that. Yeah. It's been, it's been wonderful. I've, I've had a lot of people be really motivated yeah. in various ways, both by what I call boot camp style, which is reminds me of the military, which is very like mm -hmm. blunt in your face and really harsh versus a more nurturing sort mm -hmm. of approach. Yeah. Is, uh, it, has the Me Too movement affected the BDSM community at all? Because there's such a, like pe people have one perception of BDSM and that perception of BDSM from the average person is not necessarily what's going on inside the room. And of course, everything you're doing is consensual, like clients are paying you for it. It's a, it's a two-way street. Are there people that are hesitant to engage in something like physical torture or just physical styles of play because of like the stigma of some of the things that have went on in the me too movement are people like more drawn to that like has that a really affected question. it like I, since like 2016 2017 you know, I, don't, I don't know honestly if it's really affected um the, the sessions so much, obviously, maybe the women in the industry feel a bit more empowered and are uh, more forthcoming with setting boundaries, which yeah. in our industry can be uh, something that's challenging to do, because when you strip away what goes on in the relationships that can develop and how wonderful that, that they can be, it is a service industry. Yeah. And so... Keeping that in mind, and especially if people are making this their career, they might be, you know, more willing to accept things that they don't want to because they think that they have to. So yeah. I would think that just in general, there there might be a sense of, you know, being able to be more forthcoming with boundary setting. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Wolf is a comedian that has a great joke about this where she she's talking about the things that have come out in the Me Too movement, the, the specific acts that you'll see in articles. And people go beyond just saying, uh, like they'll say, yes, it, it's obviously wrong that this was non-consensual, but also these acts are also wrong. And she's like, wait, 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 like, what if one woman's Me Too is like my thing? Like, mm -hmm. that's like what I'm into. So like consent and the act itself are two completely different things. Like she obviously, you know, she like has a whole joke about it and it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and th that I'm completely butchering, but like the just... I'd, I'd never thought about it from the woman's perspective, like the being able to be openly into things that have been condemned in the past four to five years because people are just lumping in non-consensual acts with the acts themselves and being like, oh, this is bad instead of saying like, no, 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 like some people like this. And when it's in a safe environment, you know, go for it and you can decide for yourself. I mean, that's what I love about kink is the foundation is talking about and setting boundaries mm -hmm. and consent. And I think that it is such a really important part of what I do and why people gravitate towards it. Mm -hmm. 
I actually went for the first time in a very, very, very long time to a fetish party. And I decided to bring um, a vanilla friend of mine to this party. Is vanilla like the muggle term for <laughs> BDSM? <laughs> like no, you're not in the wizarding world? <laughs> uh, v- vanilla means that you don't participate in kink. Okay. So vanilla versus kink. It's their opposites. Okay. Um, like vanilla sex, traditional. Okay. So my friend was vanilla, or is vanilla mostly, um, but has experience in like the adult industry, strip clubs, mm-hmm. things of that nature. And so they were very concerned because in their mind going to this fetish party that there yeah. were going to be people groping them and trying to touch them and fondling and all these guys kind of like glomming on to them and all yeah. this sort of stuff. And at the end of the night, my friend was like, oh, my God, that was like Dungeons and Dragons for adults. Everyone was so respectful. There was these great costumes. Yeah. That he's He was like, oh, my. I, he's like, I have worse time going to strip clubs like with people all over me that I didn't want to touch. And he's like, I can't believe how respectful yeah. everybody was. And they were blown away. They were just blown away by that. And I was like, that's what this whole industry is about. Yeah. So, yeah, as long as there is consent and boundary setting. Um, then I think we should really be able to do what we like. So, so as we end off, is are there any thoughts you have about the future of BDSM and this industry, and whether we're going to become more open about it, or we're going to, you know, go down some sort of cleansing puritanical path? Like, like, do you have any sort of opinions on the next five to 10 years of what your industry will be, especially with all the other factors like being online, augmented reality, things like this? Yeah, I mean, because I'm the optimistic <laughs> glasses, <Yeah. laughs> always half full person, I really do think that there's going to be more acceptance, more awareness, and uh, hopefully more assimilation into our society as seeing kink mm-hmm. as a norm, um, even a sexual identity for some people. Mm-hmm. And that is what I do see happening to a large degree, whether or not other factors in our society try and clamp that down and smother it and yeah. stifle it. Uh, we'll see how that develops. Unfortunately, I don't like to think so much about that aspect of it and really concentrate on the positive things that I've seen that have really changed in in this industry and in society in general and just hope that that continues for the future. Where can people follow you, check you out, YouTube, Instagram, stuff like that? And I'll link this all in the either YouTube or whatever podcast player you're listening to this on. My Instagram just got deleted. <laughs> did it really? It did. <laughs> w- when? I feel like I, was it this week? Because I feel no, like I was, No, no. Oh. Well, I have a, I have a backup okay. now, but like I had like 14 or 15,000 followers. Yeah. And so it got deleted maybe two and a half or three weeks ago. Wow, I'm sorry. It's very, very sad. So I do have a new Instagram, which is uh, Mistress Natalie NYC underscore backup. Yeah, go go give her some <laughs> some followers exactly. back. Go, go my, slam that my Instagram. First Check it out. Yes. Instagram. Yes. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, which is at Domina Natalie NY. Um, Instagram obviously is very PG. Mm-hmm. Uh, on Twitter, you'll see more of the the stuff that I sort of do. I also got banned from OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, how do you get banned from OnlyFans? <laughs> that's like the that's like the behind the scenes paywall of right. uh, anything. Well, this is the problem with BDSM yeah. and kink. Like, you could be on there and not to be completely, totally like a graphic, but like face fucking some chick until she pukes on your dick and it's fine yeah which i just learned is the the roman something well, shower sort of, yeah, sort of a hybrid roman shower yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. um which is totally fine but god forbid you have like an enema bag in the back of the picture yeah and so they just said my, my so, stuff so was it, it was the medical stuff for them that I, was like crossing I, did, the line? I did some medical i had some pictures of some needlework and some medical stuff and a uh, fisting and that that was it and that they had all all the other just like 
done. Face fucking puking in there like this colostomy bag is where we draw the line. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm kicked right. off kicked off of OnlyFans, and I honestly was probably one of the first people on OnlyFans. So it's very sad that I now no longer have yeah, that how, available. How dare to they me kick either. off an OG? <sighs> so is there another option for you for subscribers? You or know, you, honestly. Because of what I like to do, I feel most of them are really limiting. Mm. Um, there's something called dark fans I found out about. But I have a really small group of clientele that mm. like to be um, videoed, and that's about it. So I don't go out to video. It's a very different feel than in-person okay. sessions. So I've just decided that I don't think I'm going to really be doing much more video work mm. unless it's like a personal custom video for somebody that's a completely different story because they're requesting it. So, yeah, you'll just have to come and see me. You, yeah, can't, you and, can't spy. You just and, have to uh, take my word for you it. You can reach out to you through your website. Mm -hmm. Mistress Nat. Okay. And I have a link tree, um, which I believe is just Mistress Natalie. I ha I'd have to look that up. But that has like all of the videos that I've done that are out there in public. It has all of the podcasts that I've been on or yeah. most of them, um, as well as my website and my Twitter and my um, Instagram. So that's probably where you can find everything sort of all all in yeah one. well and thank you again so much for taking the time to to come on the show of course been a very eye-opening experience and i'm sure it has also been fascinating and informative for people listening to this i had a blast going through your content this week as well thank so you. definitely go check out the instagram twitter website youtube I'll, I'll again all that will be linked and and thank you so much thank you so much this was fantastic yes 